Greetings everyone, I'm Stefan and this is the ultimate guide to ship design in Stellaris. In today's video will be covering how to design proper ships and uh, we're not only going to be showcasing the best designs available in the game right now, but I'll also be demonstrating some good designs that you can use uh, with whatever technology you have at hand. Of course, not everyone will have auto cannons or neutron launchers at the very start, so of course we have to go with whatever technology you have at hand. And today's guide is going to be focused on letting you guys know what sort of designs are good and what sort of designs are bad and will fail horribly. Let's start today's coverage with the basics of ships. So as you might know, ships have three sort of hit point stats, uh, one of them being shields, these get taken out first, then it's armor, then it's hull points. At 50% or less hull points, there's a thing called a disengagement chance, uh, which we'll be covering later on in the video, but keep in mind that disengagement chance is actually a factor and should not be ignored when you're designing ships. You can increase these values by using shield modules, armor modules, and of course, hull point modules. Now, of these three, hull point modules are the cheapest, but probably least effective. Uh, as you might know, as ships go down in health, they will actually start doing less damage. And so having a ship completely outfitted with hull is not going to be a good idea, because as soon as it starts getting hit, it will start uh, dealing reduced damage, and you don't want that. However, if you can build more ships with just hull points than uh, with proper equipment, like armor and shields, uh, you can just go for it, because two ships is better than one, and obviously more firepower will win you battles. Speaking of firepower, you will have quite a few options for your weapons. Now, medium weapon slots are just one of the many weapon slots available, and uh, really, if you're playing any sort of ship, you'll be able to choose what sort of weapon slots you have by clicking on these uh, three things. So, for example, if you click on the broadside bow, we have a few options to choose from. We can choose from two medium weapons, one large weapon, or two small weapons and a guided weapon. Guided weapons are missiles, uh, and of course smaller and larger weapons are just the same weapon types, except on a slightly larger scale. Larger weapons will cost about twice as much as medium weapons, and medium weapons cost about twice as much as small weapons. So in terms of actual cost, uh, there is no difference in going with two small weapons as opposed to just one medium weapon. What does matter is their accuracy and tracking. Accuracy will generally stay the same throughout the three weapon types, however tracking will change drastically. As you can see here, tracking on this large laser is only 5% and tracking on the smaller laser is a whopping 50%. Now if you're not familiar with tracking, the way tracking works is it negates some of the enemy's evasion. So for example, if we were to fire at uh, this same ship with this exact ship, uh, we would have to deal with 21% evasion. Normally without any sort of tracking, this evasion will be subtracted from the chance to hit. Uh, chance to hit being initially just the accuracy of the weapons. So in this situation, it would be 90, because accuracy on this weapon is 90, uh, minus 21. So the chance to hit a similar ship would only be about 69%. However, if we added some tracking to the equation and negated this evasion bonus, we would be able to hit uh, all 90% of the time, and that would increase the effective uh, chance of hitting by like 25%, because of course, maths and uh, stuff like that. Tracking will not affect you too much against uh, larger ships such as cruisers, however tracking is very important against smaller ships such as corvettes and destroyers. Corvettes will easily reach 90% evasion, and if you don't have decent tracking you will have very minimal chances of hitting. You will still have a very small base chance of hitting, uh, I believe that base chance is around 5% or so, but evasion, evasion will kill you if you don't try to counter it. So as a general rule of thumb, you want smaller weapons against smaller ships, and bigger weapons against bigger ships. Now, the reason why I say that is because even though smaller and larger weapons uh, do approximately proportional DPS, with uh, larger weapons slightly beating them out, uh, larger weapons have the advantage of having much longer range. And the longer your range, the more hits you can get on your opponent before they come into range and start hitting you back. Of course, you will not always know the fleet composition of your potential enemy, uh, but as a general rule of thumb, the earlier it is in the game, the better it is to use smaller weapons. Now, by smaller weapons, I also mean medium weapons. Medium weapons will serve as a pretty good compromise between larger and smaller weapons, because they will deal sufficient DPS while also being able to track the opponents relatively well. For example, this laser will have 30 tracking, and when combined with things like sensors and other modules, you're going to have a pretty decent chance to hit smaller ships, while also retaining efficiency against larger ships. In fact, since corvettes and destroyers don't actually reach their 90% uh, evasion cap early on, you might be able to get away with just going with medium weapons as soon as possible. This can be done with your destroyers because a single destroyer can have up to two medium slots, or it can be done with your cruisers, and cruisers will have quite a bit more than two uh, medium slots, 
and actually they're quite effective as gunships early on. Of course, once battleships come to play, they'll be completely devastated, but early on, having medium weapons on ships such as these is going to be a very good idea, and uh, no matter what sort of technology you have, having this sort of build on your cruisers is going to be able to win you battles. Now that we've covered the offenses and the defenses of a ship, let's talk a little bit about the core components. The first core component of a ship is the reactor. It will affect how much power the ship generates, uh, but having too much power isn't going to really help you out. Granted, it will affect you a little bit. For example, having 65 extra power will give us uh, plus point something percent to our damage and uh, will give us just a little bit to our evasion. So going too much overboard with uh, power isn't going to affect you too much. Even if we went with a very advanced reactor here, uh, it would affect us very, very slightly. The drive is pretty self-explanatory. It will affect uh, how long it takes for a ship to jump from one system to the next. And of course, the jump drive will allow you to jump ships from one system all the way to another system, as long as you, of course, have been in the system before. Next, we have thrusters. Now, obviously, these are more useful in an offensive war than in a defensive war, but even in a defensive war, these provide a good chance to evade, and you don't want to skip out on these if you're trying to run corvette swarms. Next, we have sensors. You want to have at least tier 2 sensors so that your ships can uh, move ahead while also seeing where they're going, because, of course, if they don't know where they're going, they're not going to be able to reach that destination, so having at least tier 2 sensors is ideal. Uh, otherwise, having higher tier sensors will only increase their range of being able to sense targets and being able to track other ships. And combat computers will of course affect uh, what sort of things the ship does in combat. The ship will move towards the range designated by its combat computer and will stay at that range while doing various things. Picket ships, for example, will have very high tracking. Uh, lion ships will have very high chance to hit, which is not really too useful unless you're running very inaccurate weapons. Uh, artillery ships will have higher range, and carriers will have higher engagement range, uh, which means that, for example, if a fleet was here and uh, the enemy was here, with higher engagement range, they'll be able to engage the enemy from quite a bit further. So let's say the range of this hypothetical ship is this much. Having a higher engagement range would increase the range to like this much and you'll be able to engage the fleet from further away. That is especially useful if you're trying to catch an enemy fleet or if you're running carriers because carriers will release their strike craft the moment combat is engaged and so with carriers you want as much engagement range as possible. Now as for these auxiliary components you will have a few options. Now obviously the fire control will increase your chance of hitting which is decent enough uh, but afterburners are also a very good option. Having good afterburners on a ship will allow it to move faster, and uh, in an offensive war, speed is everything. You want to be able to defeat an enemy as quick as possible, and having high speed on your ships is going to help you out with that. It will also help you out with any maneuvers, and if you're getting chased around or chasing someone, it will help out tremendously. Besides these two components, the others are relatively niche. You don't really want to be going with any of these, uh, besides maybe a regenerative hull tissue, which is useful in long-term campaigns, and uh, enigmatic decoders and encoders, which are special event items which are granted by completing the enigmatic fortress event chain. You will not always have that thing happen in your game, so these things are very situational and uh, quite exciting to use. Now before we move on to the different weapon types, um, real quick, if you're having trouble uh, generating your own designs, you have to unclick this button in the bottom left. If you don't unclick this button, you'll not be able to save custom designs and uh, yeah, that may be a problem. One of the hottest things right now in Stellaris 2.6 is of course Strikecraft. These things have been buffed massively, uh, but have not been buffed to become overpowered. They are very powerful against smaller ships such as cruisers and destroyers, uh, but are not nearly as good against larger ships such as cruisers and uh, battleships. The problem with Strikecraft versus battleships is that battleships will probably be equipped with something like a neutron launcher. Neutron launchers have very high range, and when they fire, they get to the target immediately. Strikecraft, on the other hand, will take some time to get to the target, and uh, they actually take quite a while to deploy completely. For example, this advanced Strikecraft unit will take about 18 seconds to fully deploy from the first to the last Strikecraft. This means that by the time everyone has deployed, and uh, potentially is making their way to the other ship, you'll be able to be hit by neutron launchers twice. That is not a good ratio to have, and uh, most of the time, carriers like this will fall prey to neutral launchers in the late game. However, if the enemy is not wielding weapons like these, 
or potentially it's uh, early on in the game and you have just discovered cruisers, you'll be able to have quite a bit of fun. And especially if you tech rush and uh, become the first one to gain cruisers, you're going to be in a very dominant spot. Besides Strikecraft, you also have quite a few weapons options. For example, um, Flak and Point Defense are two potential options uh, for dealing with missiles and enemy Strikecraft, but they're not really too good. They have very limited range, and while they are good at defending against Strikecraft, if the enemy does not have Strikecraft or missiles, you know, you're basically wasting slots. So, uh, potentially, if you're even running a carrier like this, you might want to avoid even using these two slots and just save a bit of resources on these slots. Strikecraft will act as point defense anyways, and so you don't really have to worry about missiles hitting your ships. As for the guided weapon slots, uh, these things will fire missiles, and um, as far as missiles go, normal missiles aren't too good because most of the time the enemy will have some countermeasures, and while missiles will have slightly more uh, DPS than normal weapons, they're not really too good. Like, that, that's the main issue with them. They are decent, but they are not good enough to justify uh, using them over other sort of weapons, especially considering how they actually take quite a while to get to the enemy target. So, for example, this missile will have a speed of 18. A speed of 18, while Strikecraft will have a speed of 700. This means that the missile will take very long to get to the enemy ship, and if the combat is not close quarters, you will be having a very bad time. The only real option you have for guided weapon slots are torpedoes. Torpedoes will have slightly more DPS than the other missile types, and will of course deal a lot of damage when striking a target. In fact, uh, the average damage of torpedoes is extremely high, and most of the DPS will be released just at a very small burst of the opening of combat. This means that your Alpha Strike, uh, which is the initial strike of your fleet, is going to be very powerful and is going to be able to eliminate quite a few enemy ships. The more enemy ships you can eliminate with the first strike, the better, and you're going to be very good off with torpedoes versus the other missile types. Of course, if you have defeated the Pretheran Scourge, you could also be running Scourge missiles, but these things are really, really endgame. As for the other three weapon slots, uh, I've pretty much already covered them. Smaller weapons are good against smaller ships, larger weapons are against, against larger ships, and in fact, there are quite a few weapons exclusive to the smaller and larger weapon slots. For example, in the smaller slots, you can mount auto cannons, which are incredibly powerful, and uh, if you have access to auto cannons at small slots, I would definitely recommend using them. Uh, but for larger weapon slots, you can mount things like cloud lightning and neutral launchers, as well as kinetic artillery. Although, to be completely honest, kinetic artillery is made obsolete by the existence of neutron launchers. These things are just so much better, and unless you're facing an opponent with a very heavy focus on shields, you're going to be better off using neutron launchers over kinetic artillery. Anyways, with the basics of ships covered, let's talk a little bit about two very important aspects of fleet combat. Combat disengagement chance and force disparity. Combat disengagement chance affects uh, the chance of a ship to disengage and just completely remove itself from combat and come back at the end of combat. For example, right here, this ship is very low in HP, and if it were to disengage, it would uh, effectively leave combat and leave towards the starbase. It is much preferable for a ship to disengage than be destroyed in combat, because of course you can repair a ship that is at very low HP and, um, you know, use it again. But if it is destroyed completely, you will not be able to use it, and uh, it will simply sink and die. A higher disengagement chance would likely have allowed this ship to survive, and that can be achieved through a variety of means. One of the means is of course through an admiral. You have an option to recruit a trickster admiral, and uh, if we're to get him right now, yeah, that'd be excellent. So a trickster admiral will increase the combat disengagement chance by 25%. That is excellent, and you want to be going for tricksters as much as possible if you want to, you know, not sustain as many losses. You also have to know what sort of ships are especially susceptible. Uh, to being disengaged. Cruisers, particularly, are extremely survivable and will disengage a lot of the time. If you have a Trickster Admiral on your cruisers, uh, they will disengage quite a bit, and in fact, if you combine it with the Hit and Run Doctrine, using, um, you know, the Supremacy Tradition Finisher effect, you're going to be able to increase uh, disengagement chance by quite a bit further. With the Hit and Run War Doctrine, we can increase combat disengagement chance by 33%, a combination of these three things can really help you dominate early on, and um, in fact, even later on. The only problem with disengagement chance is of course if the ship gets destroyed and uh, completely skips the part where it's under 50%, you're 
yeah, it's just gonna it's just gonna die. Like there is no saving a ship that is completely doomed by a particle beam or something. However, if a ship experiences a lot of smaller hits, it will have a much higher likelihood of actually surviving. Of course, the complete opposite of hit and run is no retreat. With no retreat, your ships will fire faster, sure, but you will sustain much greater losses, and unless you're just fighting a single battle in the entirety of the war, no retreat is a really bad option. You do not want to be going no retreat because, well, you're going to be losing a lot of ships, and you don't want to be losing a lot of ships. You want to be disengaging as many ships from battle as possible, and then repairing them for a future battle, instead of just, you know, coming in and uh, having half your fleet gone after a single engagement. The other special feature that I have to mention is force disparity. If a fleet uh, is, for example, half of your naval capacity, it will receive a 50% bonus to its fire rate. That 50% bonus is not going to make the enemy fleet win, unless of course they're extremely technologically advanced, uh, but instead will cause you to suffer a lot more losses. It's more of a mechanic to uh, induce loss on the attacker than a mechanic to allow the defender to win, but a smaller fleet will still be a threat, and this is especially noticeable if you are running no retreat. Uh, normally, you will be able to disengage some of your ships, and you won't sustain too many losses from the increased fire rate. But with no retreat, yeah, you're gonna suffer. Now that we've covered the basics of fleet design and uh, all the things you should keep in mind while doing it, let's cover some very good builds. For corvettes, you have two top tier options. One of those options is to mount a lot of auto cannons and plasma cannons uh, to have very high shield damage as well as a very high hull and um, armor damage. This combination is extremely devastating and uh, these corvettes are extremely powerful, especially when used in combination with other ships. The other good type of corvette is of course the Torpvet. Now, there are two primary variants of Torpvets, uh, ones with auto cannons and ones with phase disruptors. An auto cannon is a good weapon to have, and if you are running a combined fleet, uh, it will be a good combination uh, to the fleet. But if you are running a fleet of uh, purely torpedo corvettes, you may want to go with a phase disruptor because these guys will penetrate uh, armor and shields, and uh, will really help you avoid shields entirely. With auto cannons and torpedoes, you'll be, you know, ignoring shields with the torpedoes but attacking them with auto cannons, not really producing a good result. Uh, but with this combination, you're going to be dealing a lot of damage to the armor and hull, and that is going to be excellent. The only problem with this setup is that, of course, you are running a pretty expensive build, and uh, phase disruptors, they have a very low DPS, so don't rely on them to kill anything. Moving up a class, we have destroyers. These things are quite powerful, uh, but aren't really good by themselves. Uh, there is one build for destroyers that is quite decent, uh, that being the high evasion neutron destroyer, uh, but it only really works if you have very high tier modules and if you are running the psionic ascension. As you may know, psionic ascension will grant you admirals with extra evasion and uh, that is particularly necessary for these guys because otherwise they're going to have high-ish evasion but not enough to effectively avoid enemy shells. For these destroyers, you want to be either using neutron launchers and uh, medium plasma cannons, or you want to be using some picket uh, instead. Destroyers are decent for point defense, uh, but generally you want to have, you know, just a ship with some strikecraft. Uh, strikecraft work as a much better point defense, and uh, wasting medium slots for PD is not a good idea. Now moving on to the bigger ships, you have two primary options. You have cruiser carriers, and you have cruisers with pure medium slots. Cruisers with pure medium slots can of course be, uh, you know, fitted with whatever sort of armor you have. You could have like tier 2 armor on them, just slap whatever you have that is best on them and uh, send them out into the battlefield. If you have a very high disengagement chance, these things will absolutely wreck anyone on sight and um, if you meet any sort of corvettes, destroyers or other cruisers, these things will come out on top. However, cruiser carriers are also a viable option and uh, if you get them as early as possible, yeah, you're going to be dominating the galaxy. If you have just a few of these things running around, they'll be able to defeat uh, any station because uh, they'll be able to sit outside of the range of any station and they'll be able to defeat pretty much any sort of fleet their same size as long as it's corvettes and destroyers. Anything bigger, uh, these ships will be ineffective against and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. You might want to run a couple of these later on just to have uh, some point defense but generally you want to avoid using these things or any sort of other carrier uh, up into the late game. You see, once battleships come into power, cruisers are obsolete. These things will absolutely overmatch and overkill any sort of cruiser they see, and competing against battleships with cruisers is not going to be a fun time. You see, if you fit out your battleships optimally, uh, that being with a single giga cannon and four neutron launchers, 
you're going to be having a very good time. Uh, this sort of combination will allow your ship to stay at a very long range and just pommel the target with shells and neutrons. It's a very powerful combo, especially against larger ships. And against smaller ships, you probably want to be running uh, perhaps, you know, a single battleship with uh, some hangar bays or something. But having a fleet of uh, majority these guys will be optimal and uh, just spamming these in the late game is a very good option. Of course, the Giga Cannon is not the only weapons option available to this ship uh, because the focused arc emitter is almost as good. In fact, if you have a fleet of just focused arc emitter ships with nothing else, um, it is not that bad, surprisingly. So running focused arc emitters is a very good idea, and especially later on when all the repeatables increase uh, shield and armor points significantly, these things are going to melt through hull, and uh, being able to ignore all shields and armor is a very significant advantage, because at some point, you'll be ignoring about, you know, 80% of the enemy's health. Like, that is incredible, and uh, focused arc emitters are very strong. As far as the bigger ships go, you want to be using approximately the same style as the battleships. Uh, for Titans, you'll just want to spam more neutron launchers and have a Perdition Beam instead of your Giga Cannon. The Perdition Beam is very strong and uh, its 250 range is very powerful as well. Especially when combined with a carrier combat computer, now, this ship will be able to engage anyone from across the system and um, you'll be able to catch a fleet by just putting one of these Titans in your fleet. Putting it into your fleet will also allow you to buff your fleet or debuff the enemy fleet with some auras. Uh, these auras are not too significant, uh, probably one of the best ones is the plus tracking one, uh, but you do have some pretty powerful auras when you move on to Juggernauts. Juggernauts are pretty much the upgrade of Titans, uh, these things are incredible, they come pretty late into the research tree and are quite expensive to build. However, these ships act as uh, a shipyard and uh, you'll be able to build ships on them, which is incredible. These things will also auto repair after combat because of course they have a shipyard on them and you'll be able to set other ships to have the juggernaut as their home base. This means that when they retreat, they'll retreat to the juggernaut, which can then heal them and put them back into battle. This serves as a sort of mobile fortress and um, potentially can also serve as a mobile raider. This thing can easily jump into a system, pump out a bunch of ships and jump into another system. So as far as raiding goes, this thing is the perfect candidate. For it, you just want to be using uh, as many strike craft as possible, and you want to be using an appropriate aura. If you want to be just uh, running around and dealing with enemies by yourself, you of course want the strike craft damage and speed uh, aura, but otherwise, you really want the plus weapons range plus 40% thing. This aura will allow you to engage the fleet first and uh, wreak absolute havoc with your alpha strike. There are, of course, other auras on the Juggernaut, uh, including this aura, which allows it to jump in and uh, retreat into another system after only 120 days, and um, two others, which are relatively meh and um, I would never go for. Now, while we're on the subject of big carriers, uh, we can talk about two modules that have been buffed significantly in 2.6.3. Amoeba Flagellia and Swarm Strikers have been buffed pretty substantially, uh, but are still quite bad. Uh, in fact, Amoeba Flagellia are worse than Tier 2 Strikecraft, and uh, Swarm Strikers are decent, but they're really, really, really late game. And by that point, when everyone is running around with battleships, strikers are virtually obsolete. But anyways, that'll do it for today. If you want more informative content like this, uh, please stick around the channel. And um, yeah, there's going to be more guides coming. Anyways, thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.